Hey everyone! I'm Albert Boris. Super Mario Bros. Wonder is finally here. After many months of waiting and even more years of speculation, the next mainline Mario adventure finally released a couple of days ago. This has been one of my most anticipated video games ever for the past few years, and probably a lot of you as well. So much so that I beat the main story in a single day. Up there with the likes of Freddy Fish and Quest for Glory, the Mario series is a childhood gem of mine, having grown up with it since I was five. So whenever Nintendo announces a new platformer in this iconic series, it's always been a hype time for me. And Super Mario Bros. Wonder in particular caught my interest back when it was revealed in June. It had been rumored for a while that Nintendo was working on a brand new 2D Mario adventure, unlike anything seen before, and to say that it got me hooked would be a huge understatement. The 2D platformer genre is pretty much where it all started. Even if I may prefer the more open-world sandbox games, it can't be denied just how much of an impact adventures like Mario 3 and Mario World had on not just the Mario franchise, but video gaming as a whole, arguably. And despite this, the 2D Mario games have always been kinda inconsistent. After Super Mario World, it didn't take until 16 years later to revisit this formula in the form of New Super Mario Bros. And we all know what happened after that. Ugh. I mean, the new Super Mario Bros. series isn't bad. I played quite a lot of these games when I was younger, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's a reason we haven't had another 2D Mario game until now since 2012. No, Mario Maker doesn't count. Everyone knew that Nintendo had to step up their game after they practically killed people's interest in 2D Mario with this series. And well, they definitely did, as evident by the trailers. Words cannot express how excited I've been to try out an actual new 2D Mario game, because let's be fair, that title did not age very well with the new Super Mario series. And now that it's here, you might wonder, is this game as good as I hoped for? Well, I mean, let's just start off by saying, no game is perfect. In fact, none of my favorite games are either. There were things I absolutely loved. There were also things I didn't really like, as well as stuff I wish they would have done more with. So, I thought, why not go through all of it in this review? There's so much to uncover that I want to talk about. And even at over 25 minutes, there wasn't a way for me to mention everything this game does, spoilers included. And speaking of which, yeah, there will be final boss spoilers. I'll give you a warning when it happens, but yeah. Enough talk, let's get right into this gem. Five seconds in and I've sadly already found two problems. Firstly, there's only one save file per profile. Uh. I mean, I guess it's not a major issue. I can just create a new profile if I want to replay the game from scratch, but come on. Super Mario Odyssey and 3D World had multiple save files, and this is a newer game. Ah oh well, the character roster also has its ups and downs. On one hand, you've got 12 playables, the most out of any mainline Mario game, which is pretty impressive considering it's usually just 4 or 5. But sadly, Yoshi and Nabbit are forced into easy mode. They won't take damage and also can't collect any power-ups. It's a bit disappointing. I don't mind an easy mode, but at least give us the option to play as them normally. I can see why Nabbit is this way, considering his role in New Super Luigi U, but Yoshis can already flutter jump, ride other players and eat enemies. Isn't that easy enough? Ah, uh, I promise I won't just be complaining. It's just, this would have been so simple to fix. But yeah, we select our character and onward we go to the Flower Kingdom, a neighboring land to the Mushroom Kingdom. We were invited here by Prince Florian, who I guess wants to show off his collection of wonder flowers. And then Bowser shows up out of nowhere, snatches the flower, and merges himself with the prince's castle to take over the universe. God, he looks so adorable. So it's up to Mario and his friends to fix the mess they caused. No, I'm serious. There were a full 20 seconds between the time Kamek showed up and Bowser grabbed the flower, and you all just stood there. I hope you sleep well at night. Then again, maybe they wanted some adventure. In that respect, I would have done the same. The Flower Kingdom is, expectedly, the main setting of the game, and it's quite unlike anything we've seen before. As a concept, I wasn't too sure about it at first glance. Like, am I meant to believe that the Mushroom Kingdom just happens to have a neighbor we've never heard of? Don't we already have the Bean Bean Kingdom? But I really like the direction they went for, making it kind of a twin realm to the Mushroom Kingdom, except with flower elements. Flower people, flower houses, flower items, and even these talking things. My name is Walter Hartwell White. These tiny flowers are found all over the kingdom, often even multiple times in a single level, giving advice, being comedic, or even just blurting out nonsense. It's pretty safe dialogue for the most part. Wonder what you taste like. Hold the f up. 
Similarly, I wasn't too sure what to think of these at first. NPCs with fully voiced English dialogue seemed a bit too weird for a Mario game, and in a worst case scenario, they might have ended up becoming annoying to listen to. Luckily, there is a way to turn them off, but honestly, I ended up finding them kinda charming. There is a bit of mystery surrounding them, like, what are they? Why are they here? And what relation do they have to the Poplins? Questions we'll never know. But it adds a bit of mystique to the experience. And speaking of which, the experience. On the surface, it has seven different worlds for you to explore. Six main areas, as well as the Petal Isles, which are surrounded by the other ones. And these areas, well, they go all out on the theming. Gone are the traditional grasslands, deserts and forest themes. The first world, Piprak Plateau, alone is more impressive than the whole new Super Mario Bros. series combined. In just one single area, you've got the grasslands, savanna, autumn forest, underground forest, polluted forest, cliffs and more. And the best part? None of it feels out of place. The world map is structured in a way that all levels feel naturally integrated to the area. And there is a wide variety of level types as well. On one hand, you have the regular ones. They're some of the most unique levels I've played in any 2D Mario, each and every one tackling a really unique gimmick. They're short enough that you can speed through them if you want to, but if you take your time, there is a surprising lot to uncover. And I like that. But you've also got badge challenges that force you to beat the level using a badge. And completing them gives you access to use said badge in any level you'd like. And then you've also got these short minigames scattered throughout the map that include anything from racing against Wiggler, defeating enemies within a time limit, or looking for wonder tokens hidden throughout the plaza. Speaking of which, they are way too cryptic to find. Like, how am I supposed to know that you should push this pipe when none of the others would budge? But yeah, there is a lot of variety, and it's not just the first world. Besides World 6, a lava world as generic as you could possibly imagine, all areas are incredibly fun and unique to explore. World 3's Shining Falls, for example, has this really unique cubic art style, although it's kinda underwhelming narratively. More on that later. And World 5's Fungi Mines has this picturesque mushroom swamp with uncharted ruins below. My goodness, is it gorgeous. World 2's Fluff Puff Peaks seems to especially have made a place in people's hearts, with the pink fluffy tree above a winter wonderland, and I don't necessarily disagree. Although for me personally, World 4's Sunbaked Desert especially stuck with me, with the huge fortress in the white sands. I loved how it was basically one huge open area that allowed you to play the levels in any order you'd like. And there was a surprising amount of secrets. Honestly, I couldn't give any of these worlds justice if I wanted to. I'd have to make a separate ranking video if I truly wanted to shine some light on them. Even Petal Isles was pretty cool. It's not quite a world in the same sense as the other six, it's more like a hub that connects these different locations, including Bowser. But it also has its fair share of unique levels, so it still kinda counts. That said, perhaps the standout feature of Super Mario Bros. Wonder, though, would have to be the Wonder Flower and seeds. Each of the 69 regular levels have this mysterious looking flower. According to the Super Mario Bros. Wonder Direct, they thrive off the mysterious powers of this kingdom, and when interacted with, they let go of it all and trigger a wonder effect. Now what is a wonder effect? That's an excellent question, because there's not actually a single answer. The best way to sum it up is that weird things start happening on the level. Sometimes, inanimate objects come to life. Other times, there will be a musical number. Sometimes, you'll even take on a new form, whether it be a Goomba, a Spinny, or best of all, Jesse Pinkman. By the first level, I thought it was a neat way to spice up the gameplay. By the second level, my god, I think we all share the same reaction when the Piranha Plant started singing. I love how many of these wonder effects also feel like references to other Nintendo media. For example, the effect when the world around you would slow down or speed up gave me huge flashbacks of Super Paper Mario, and the airship levels with the crosshair aiming in on you immediately made me think of Donkey Kong Country 3. It's quite amazing. Originally, the Wonder Flower was actually just gonna warp you to a new area. Thank goodness they went for something more original. But yeah, the main purpose of the Wonder Flower is that while the level is under this effect, you have to get to a certain point of the map in order to find a Wonder Seed. The Wonder Seeds are kind of the main collectible in the game. And honestly, they're practically worthless. You need them in order to progress with the game, however, the minimum required is so laughably low for how easy it is to find them. Because the Wonder Effect is just one way to get them. You also earn them by finishing a level for the first time, including secret exits. Each shop also sells one seed, and you'll even be gifted them sometimes for no particular reason. I feel like they should have made them either harder to find, or at least raise the minimums needed to proceed to certain areas. Because on just my first playthrough, I had almost twice the amount of seeds needed to unlock the first world's castle. And I wasn't even trying, but oh well. On another note, I love how they have a different color depending on which world you're playing on though. It doesn't really change anything, but it's nice with variety, just like with the power moons in Mario Odyssey. 
And those aren't the only collectibles, however. Reaching the top of the flagpole in each level also counts towards the 100% completion. And just like in the New Super Mario series, you've got three big purple coins scattered throughout the level that you need to find. They're not as important as Wonder Seeds, but if you want those seven medals on your save file, you might want to start exploring. The purple coins in particular are actually part of a larger subset, as they add 10 coins to your purple coin counter. Yeah, just like in Super Mario Odyssey, there are two currencies in the game. On one hand, you have regular coins, which do absolutely nothing, except giving you a 1-up when you reach 100. The purple coins, however, allow you to buy stuff from the shops, as well as hire poplins to remove the blockades. Unlike Wonder Seeds, these are actually worth every penny, just because of how much you can buy in the shop. I was a bit sad to learn that there was a maximum to how much you could carry at once, but hey, it is what it is. I mostly ended up using them to buy the badge power-ups. Which brings us to the power-ups. Surprisingly, there aren't really a lot of them in the game. Among the returning ones, we will have the Super Mushroom, Fire Flower and Invisibility Star, and 1-ups if you count them. However, it's all compensated by the game's free brand new power-ups, and if I'm gonna be completely honest here, these are some of the best power-ups ever introduced. They're not only creative on the surface, but they're so incredibly versatile. Let's start off with the Elephant Fruit, the most iconic one introduced. At first, I was a bit worried that they only added it for marketing, because, let's be fair, this looks so ridiculously adorable. Wow, Zowie! But I was surprised by how useful it is. You can defeat enemies up close with your trunk, destroy blocks, become stronger, and spray water on flowers to find secrets. I still don't really understand how elephants are relevant to the flower kingdom, but one thing's for sure, they're incredibly fun to use. The level music will even change to incorporate trumpets, which is a nice touch. Actually, it's not. I prefer the music without the add-on trumpets, since they kinda detract from the original atmosphere the songs were going for. Uh, my favorite new power-up though would have to be the Bubble Flower. Don't ask Nintendo where they got the idea. It's probably the most limited of the game's new power-ups, but despite that, I always find myself having the most fun with what little I have. You can shoot bubbles to insta-kill enemies, and you can even jump off of them to reach more distant areas. Plus, the suit just looks really nice. And then there's also the Drill Mushroom. I mean, it's alright, like... Overrated as f Okay, that was a bit harsh. A lot of people like to compare this to the Spin Drill in Super Mario Galaxy 2. However, I think a more accurate parallel would be more in Luigi's Superstar Saga, where Mario can hammer Luigi into the ground to become a mole. I do find it kinda odd that out of all possible items, they decided to make this a mushroom, but whatever. With this item, you can drill into the ground and ceiling to reach otherwise blocked off areas, as well as kill any enemies with your drill. Sadly, I don't really find it as useful as the other two. It's not introduced until about halfway through the game, so you don't really get to use it all that much. Only about three levels actually reward you for digging into the ground, which by the way is slower than just walking. Sure, it's powerful, but if I want to defeat enemies up close, I'll just boot up the elephant fruit which has that and more. It's still really fun, and surprising foes is pretty satisfying. It's just not as great as the other two. And technically, those aren't actually the only power-ups. There's also badges. They're not quite power-ups in the same sense as the ones we just talked about, but they assist you in other ways. These are earned either by completing the respective badge challenges, or by finding them in a shop. And they come with all sorts of perks, from being able to run quicker, swim more efficiently, jump higher, and more. There are even badges that transforms any power-up into your preferred one. And who can forget the expert badges that actively make the game harder for you? Like the dreaded invisibility badge. I will never forgive it. While the badges do, for the most part, make it easier to play, they also make it more fresh, since there are ultimately so many different ways to experience the levels. But let's be fair, the double wall kick will forever be the most useful. Super Mario Bros. Wonder also has, my goodness, one of the most practical online modes out of any Mario game. If you've grown up with Mario, you've probably played a fair share of multiplayer, and you know how absolutely barbaric it can be. One player gets ahead and the others have to stand the fall. It might have been a little too chaotic for online, and that's not mentioning the inevitable lag. Well, this game somehow pulled it off perfectly by not being able to interact with other players. No, seriously. You can see them, you can share items, and you can even communicate with each other. But you can't directly interact with them, and whatever wacky things you do to the level won't affect them. There is only one exception to when you can interact with them, and that's when you die. Because you won't actually lose a life immediately. You have about 5 seconds to touch another player, or a standy. Wait, standy? If you crouch and press X while in multiplayer, you can kinda make yourself a checkpoint in a level that you have to touch in case you die. And apparently, there are also collectible that go towards 100% completion. There is actually quite a lot of them. 
Honestly, online makes a lot of these levels easier than they'd normally be, considering you can just save yourself if you die. And other players are always eager to help out a friend in need. It's a rare instance where people aren't actively trying to kill each other in gaming, and that's kind of beautiful actually. What's not beautiful, however, are the boss battles. This just makes me sad thinking about. This game has so many creative ideas, and yet the bosses are about as dull as you could possibly imagine. This is the moment the video begins to enter spoiler territory, so if you haven't played most of the game yet, I'd suggest you to skip to this timestamp now. Unless, of course, you don't mind spoilers. But yeah, it seems like everyone agrees that this single aspect is a huge stain on the otherwise near-perfect gem this game is. And honestly, it's not just the bosses. The boss dungeons in general feel much more uninspired than the rest of the game's levels, since they mostly just put you in a regular castle. Oh wait, sorry. Palace. Uh... I thought the first world's palace was actually pretty cool, since it largely took place outside the castle walls and had its ominous yellow fog. But then the following palaces are about what you'd expect from the bare minimum. World 4's palace in particular. You'd think that when the entire world is basically one huge fortress, that the boss level would be a bit more unique to stand out. Instead, I had to remind myself that this isn't New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Like, this is embarrassing. We're off to a bad start here. At least the music is pretty catchy, even if it's a bit goofy and for some reason reminds me of the Angry Birds theme song. But then we get to the bosses themselves. Or should I say, boss. Because it's just Bowser Jr. every single time. And no, King Boo doesn't count. Also, he looks too much like a Lego minifigure. Conceptually, the bosses aren't that bad. All the fights are distinct from each other gameplay-wise, even if they follow the same goal, jump on Bowser Jr.'s head four times. It's not that they're not fun, and at least it gets progressively more difficult over time. But they're still kinda underwhelming and simple, especially when they're the only thing you get to fight at the end. As mid-bosses, they would have been serviceable. As world bosses, I'd expect more from this game. Same can be said for the airship levels. Some of the worlds have airship stages, and I love the levels by themselves. They're some of the more difficult and climactic levels in the game, and the use of Super Mario Bros. 1's airship theme from Mario Maker is perfect. But then you get to the boss battle, and you're just running in a straight line to hit the self-destruct button. But hey, at least it's something, right? It may not be much, but at least we do have a boss battle at the end of each world. I shouldn't have said anything. Get this! World 3 Shining Falls and World 5 Fungi Mines don't have a boss. I wish I was joking, because I honestly don't know what to say. Like yeah, the bosses are a bit underwhelming, but at least they're still fun and bring some sort of closure to each respective world. Or well, for World 5, I don't really mind it. The narrative is already interesting enough, exploring uncharted ruins to save an expedition, and the ending is really heartwarming. But World 3, in my opinion, is actively hurt by this decision. It seems like most people rate this world lower than the rest, and I can't say I don't understand why. Just give me your goddamn wonder seed, Poplin. Bowser is trying to take over the world, and you want me to do your trials to earn it. There are bigger things going on. Uh... But at least the final boss is pretty cool. After you beat the main six worlds of the game, Bowser will have a short little monologue about how he's already finished preparations, and he's so generous that he allows us to enter his body for a sneak preview. Man, they're going all out on the more RPG references, aren't they? Well, THANK YOU! Being the saint he is, he even prepared some trials for us before the real party starts. Say what you will about Bowser, but at least his trials are more fun than Yoda's here. Then again, they're also more intense and climactic. Get this, we have a Bullet Bill, we have Torpedo Ted, and now we also have a Missile Meg. This is just amazing. But yeah, after we're warmed up, we're finally here, at Bowser's Rage Stage. And this is a really solid final boss level. It tricks you into thinking you'll first be having a standoff against Bowser Jr. until his wonder effect backfires on him. Now yes, this may be an auto-scroller, but it's a damn good one. It truly made it feel like all of the game's elements converged for a final showdown, with lots of familiar faces and foes, even King Boo with his too deep voice. At first, this simply seems like good game design, you know, taking what you've learned. But the best part is that it actually makes sense narratively. The closer you get to the battle, the general vibes start to change as well. You hear clappings in the background, and notice this huge stage in the distance. And that's when you realize that all of these familiar faces are here for something bigger. And then you finally make it. <laughs> Honestly, I'm kinda speechless. 
As far as 2D Mario goes, this has got to be the greatest build-up to a final boss battle ever. Which admittedly isn't saying much, but I mean it. And the battle itself, my goodness. I don't think we've had a final boss quite as bopping as this one. Like, you have to jump in tune to the beat in order to avoid enemies and hit the switch on Bowser's chin. This gimmick was only seen in one other level in World 4, so I was kinda surprised that they ended up using it for an even more important purpose, but I dig it. I especially love how Bowser will bop to the music. But then the battle just kinda ends out of nowhere. As the fight goes on, it gets more and more frantic until Bowser eventually loses his outer shell, and you just gotta hit him one more time. That's when you've angered him, and this is it! His last phase! Never mind, I spoke too soon again. To be honest, this is the only real issue I have. Like, there should be something more. The Rage stage is amazing, but the vibes I get from it is that it's once again building up to something bigger because it's honestly just not that difficult. Maybe I'm just spoiled after every other Mario game had a second phase, but I don't know, I just felt a bit empty after beating it, especially considering the fake out. So good thing that's not the last you see of this game, as there's also a secret special world. Oh, thank god. Super Mario Bros. Wonder, like most other Mario games, is also home to its own take on a special world. In this case, you access each of the seven levels by finding a secret exit in each of the main worlds which then connect to this open area once you beat them. These levels are... surprisingly not that hard. I expected these levels to be brutally difficult, seeing as early reviewers kept emphasizing it. Really? You want a brutally difficult Mario game? I've got one right here. Speak into the lily pad. Most of these levels are only difficult the first time around because you're going in with zero expectations, but once you're familiar with them, it's really not that bad. Like, this is just a Geometry Dash level. Once you learn the route, it's a cakewalk. Besides the one with the colorful blocks and the pinball machine, I beat most of them on my second or third tries. But afterwards, you get to the semi-final test. This is where I started getting a bit of problems. Not only is it the return of the legendary Piranha Plant Parade, but it's absolutely wild. There's just so much stuff that you have to avoid, all the while the level is auto-scrolling pretty quickly. I did end up beating after a couple of tries, but it was definitely my most problematic challenge yet. Completing it unlocks this flower propeller, which will take you to the final test, Wonder Gauntlet. It was honestly kinda underwhelming. If you're familiar with the likes of Perfect Run, Champion's Road, and Darker Side, you probably have a good idea of what this level is like. It's kind of Super Mario Bros. Wonder's take on the super difficult final challenge. Like those levels, there are no checkpoints. If you lose, you gotta start all over again. This level in particular puts you against several wonder effects from your adventure, except in a much more frantic environment. So it's kind of a culmination of what you've learned, but I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it just didn't really feel like a final level. Once again, I found it surprisingly easy. It didn't take me more than 20 tries, and once I got the hang of it, a lot of the sections were surprisingly simple, as long as you were familiar with them. Like here you're just dashing. And even the atmosphere is kinda dull. It feels more like just a random mishmash of some gimmicks you're familiar with, and a flawless run doesn't even take much more than 3 minutes to complete, and when I did beat it, I didn't really feel all that satisfied. The music just went back to the usual quiet castle theme, I moved on with the game. Even with Prince Florian's little speech, I couldn't care less. But then, I collected every wonder seed, flower coin, reached the top of the flagpole in all levels, and that's when I learned the shocking truth. That wasn't actually the final level. Well, I guess that explains why I was underwhelmed by it. Because after doing this, you unlock the final, final test. Now this is more like it. The final final test puts you against several challenges that need to be completed using badges. This actually gets quite difficult, even with numerous checkpoints. It was the first time in the game for me that I got not one, but two game overs. And they definitely nailed the atmosphere better. I always wondered why the music that would play for badge challenges was this climactic space theme. Well, now I know why. It perfectly fits the final challenge, and truly makes you feel like you're taking everything you've learned for the last battle. The last bit when you're invisible is especially brutal, and I missed the top of the flagpole twice. Without a doubt, this was a more than solid final impression to Super Mario Bros. Wonder. And that was all I had to say about Super Mario Bros. Wonder. Well, not all. I'll probably be making a couple of rankings and maybe challenge videos where I go into certain topics more in-depth. This video is getting a little too long anyways. But overall, yeah, Super Mario Bros. Wonder is a game that does a lot of right, but still has a couple of problems. 
However, in retrospect, most of these issues are rather trivial and pale in comparison to everything this game does right. The levels are some of the most creative I've ever played. The wonder effect spices up the gameplay in just the right way, and the new features, whether it be badges, online or new power-ups, are just great. Even if the bosses in their dungeons could be better, they don't actively hurt the experience all that much. Without a doubt, this is the best 2D Mario game of all time. No more first place Super Mario World. Even compared to some of the 3D adventures, I'd say this one comes incredibly close to some of my personal favorites, such as Mario Sunshine and Odyssey. And there's just so much replay value. Even if I did end up completing it in a little over 4 days, I want to re-experience this gem like I've never played it before, because this is one of my new favorite Mario games of all time. Overall, I'd give it a 9.5 out of 10. Absolutely amazing. Probably the best game I've ever viewed so far. And that was it for this video. But what are your thoughts on the game? Did you agree with me or not? If you liked this video, then make sure to like, share and subscribe to my channel as I talk about everything more related. With all that being said, I'm signing off. Until next time.